well, everybody, we are really uh, delighted and feel honored to have Doug Tallamy with us here today. Uh, Doug is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agricultural and Natural Resources uh, in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Uh, he lives in Pennsylvania nearby. Uh, and his, his academic research focuses on the relationships between insects and plants, and I think more recently, insects, plants, and birds. Uh, he's also a best-selling author of a series of what I would call landscape ecology books uh, for those, those of us who uh, have gardens or interests in gardens. They're wonderful. They include the Living Landscape, which he co-authored with Rick Dark, Bringing Nature Home, and most recently, Nature's Best Hope. Uh, and then another book called The Nature of Oaks, uh, which uh, goes chapter by chapter, month by month through a large oak tree on his property and tells us about all of the insects and birds and things going on in the life of the oak tree. It's really a creative uh, way to go about it. Uh, he's also co-creator with Michelle Alfandari of a movement called the Homegrown National Park, which I'm sure he'll describe, and it's something that we can all participate in, and as we, Jen and I told him this morning, we have both put our properties into the database of the Homegrown National Park. Uh, so type your questions into the Zoom Q&A. If Jen and I can <laughs> answer them, we'll do it on the spot. Um, if not, we'll ask Doug later, or we'll do both of those. Uh, and uh, so we'll get going, give Doug a big Zoom round of applause, and take it away, Doug. Thank you, Dan. I've never heard a Zoom round of applause. That, that would be good. All right, today I want to talk about my idea of what nature's best hope is. But before I do that, let's talk about uh, E.O. Wilson's idea of how we could save life on planet Earth. Edward O. Wilson, of course, from Harvard. Uh, extremely long and productive career. He died the day after Christmas this year, so it was a terrible loss to the world of conservation. But one of the things that was consistent throughout his very long career was his interest in life and biodiversity um, and how to save it on planet Earth. He knew it wasn't optional. We needed it for our own good. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And um, in it, he just he had one simple message, and that was, if we don't save nature, if we don't save functioning ecosystems on at least half of planet Earth, we're going to lose life everywhere. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save life on half of planet Earth. Of course, it's a wonderful idea to conservation biologists. We'll just put half the Earth aside and everything will, will thrive. It'll be great. The problem is um, we don't have half the earth to put aside. Half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture. We've got 8 billion people and all of our airports and roadways and detritus in the other half. Uh, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how could we actually do this? That's what I want to talk about today. I, I do think we can realize EO's dream, but uh, we're going to need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talked about that, let me, let me uh, mention something that happened on the East Coast in 2019. Uh, we had a very large oak mast. All the members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Now, you have oak masts in the West as well, but uh, that was a big one. Now, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there, forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. And then it plopped down, and that's a dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And then within that chamber, converts itself to a pupa and surprisingly stays as a pupa in that underground chamber for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets into the acorn. 
Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the very next year? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole in it, uh, kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes, post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point with this little story? Uh, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between, uh, mostly between animals and plants. This is another one, the relationship between jays and, and oaks, jays and acorns. They are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, fly up to a mile from the parent tree, tap it below the surface of the soil, uh, and then go and have something to eat during the winter time. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. And it's jays all over the country doing this. We have seven or eight species of jays with a very close um, relationship with acorns. A uh, specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have the beloved E. marginia, this beautiful moth, unless you have mistletoe. Um, that is the only plant that that moth develops on. And of course, you're not going to have mistletoe unless you have the oaks that support that mistletoe. You won't have 60 species of native California bees without the pollen from sunflowers, particularly perennial sunflowers. Turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, uh, and over a third of them are specialized on particular pollens. So nature is, is a series of specialized relationships, and I can talk about those relationships uh, for weeks on end. Uh, the point I want to make this morning is that um, these relationships, nature itself, uh, is now on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't really leave it as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to the original pristine ecological condition. And those are mostly mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have grazed it, drained it. We got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need because it's nature that keeps us alive on this planet. Why have we done this? I don't know, but I suspect we thought that, that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines on a regular clip here. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now the UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. And they said that two years ago, so now it's the next 18 years. You know, it makes a nice headline, but it is not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. We have to, we have to get serious about saving them. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment that's upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk's about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts uh, from lots of, of people, uh, people like you and me, just ordinary people. But those efforts have delivered enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits 
to everybody. To return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth were to lose its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappear, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrates, our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and those animals would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our birds, we can save our insects, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We're totally dependent on, on the life support that natural systems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are a few things that plants do that we totally depend on, like produce oxygen, like clean water, they, they, they clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, <clears throat> building their tissues out of that carbon, but then also pumping the extra carbon into the ground through their root system. Uh, our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. And once it's in the soil, it's extremely stable, can last uh, thousands of years. Plants build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that will be difficult. What do animals do for plants? Lots of things, but they, they provide pest control services, really important. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services uh, is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because we've got so many people demanding ecosystem services more and more every single day. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves. They're doing the best they can, but it's obviously not good enough because we are now in the middle of the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever experienced. So we need to start to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes like this. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. Uh, and he, Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods. But our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely ruining an area and going to another area doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo had a lot of faith in him as he, he believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, is, was creating a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot live together, we cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, unfortunately that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I wanna argue this morning is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, let's go back to private property. Um, we can't ignore private property because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 
78% of the entire country is privately owned. California actually has the least amount of private property. Only 52% of California is privately owned, but it's still a big chunk of land. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not really using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left. Absolutely. That has been our, our conservation model for the last century. But we have to go beyond that now. We now have to restore the places where we've dismantled nature uh, because that's, that's an awful lot of places. In other words, we're talking about restoration. And before you tell me that you can't ever put it back the way it was before you, you dismantle it, um, I know that. But we can reunite enough of the specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature uh, so that you have functioning ecosystems again. That's the goal, even if it's not exactly what was at that site some point in the past. But to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the, the most important groups. And there are two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants. They're capturing energy from the sun and converting it through photosynthesis into the food that supports just about all the animal life on planet Earth. So now we have energy, we have the food uh, that, that the sun actually provides us, stored in plant parts. But if we don't get the food from plants to animals, we don't have any animals, then we don't have any functioning ecosystems. Well, it turns out most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants, most, not just any invertebrates, just typically insects and typically caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, it's going to be failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's the chickadee. That's my feeder uh, in, in this part of Pennsylvania. Uh, you've got uh, mountain chickadees and western chickadees and other things in California. They're all pretty much the same bird doing the same thing. Uh, they are eating seeds during the wintertime. 50% of their diet is seeds, so we see them in our feeders all the time. Uh, but when it comes time to reproduce, they, the babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to invertebrates, typically insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students, Ashley Kennedy did a few years ago. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country to take pictures of, of uh, birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. Some of you might have participated in this. They were going to send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify the prey items in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds as possible. And she got thousands of pictures. It was a big success. You're looking at a, a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families in North America, caterpillars dominated the nestling diet. So again, what would happen if we didn't design landscapes with enough caterpillars in them? Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible, so the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also rel relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of, of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and many beetles have very sharp edges too. Then finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. 
Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from during the breeding season? From their prey items, of course, but look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's, that's where the carotenoids are in green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and, and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are <clears throat> not optional parts of most bird diets. They're essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. So let's go back to chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they, they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to count those, but you're, you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all we have. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. They're only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And that's true for most of our birds. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect declines is one of the major uh, reasons we've got bird declines around here. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. Things like doves and finches that can make a little milk out of seeds so they can rear their young without insects. And look, they didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose birds. So we need, we need a new goal for landscaping. In the past, we've had one goal, and that is to make pretty landscapes. We need to expand that goal. Now we need pretty landscapes that are also ecologically functional, and you're not going to do that without having caterpillars in those landscapes. So how do we add caterpillars to our landscapes? You do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars, so we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about it. Choose the plants that support a lot of caterpillars because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. This is a monarch butterfly caterpillar. And you can have all the eucalyptus or all of the, the ginkgo or all of the Eastern trees, all of the things that you typically landscape with. Uh, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly unless you have one of the milkweeds. That is the only thing they develop on. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plant lineages for which they have specialized adaptations. Why do they have all those adaptations? Because plants don't want to be eaten. Plants want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. Well, at least in the east, it's green here. Uh, it's not because there's no insects out there that want to, want to uh, eat this it's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat plants for which they have those, those um, adaptations that allow them to get around those plant defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. Behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked in to eating it. So for example, if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace it with, with uh, some plant from Asia or from the Mediterranean, um, the monarchs are not gonna start to eat that, that plant from another continent. 
they have two choices at that point. They will fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. It turns out there are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that act actively remove energy from local food webs. A good example of a plant that contributes energy, actually more energy than any other plants in the country would be one of our oaks. Um, they really are super plants in terms of sharing their energy. A good example of a non-contributor would be a, a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Um, it's there, it's not invasive, but it, nothing eats it. It doesn't contribute any energy to a local food web. And a good example of a, a, uh, a detractor would be, this is calorie pear, Bradford pear from the East, terrible invasive ornamental. Um, you've got uh, Himalayan blackberry and lots of other things. These invasives that we bring over from other continents that don't support insects, but do displace native plants. This is what it looks like when calorie pear escapes where, where I live. So you're removing the plants that support our food webs and replacing it with a plant that doesn't. That is detracting energy. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs, if we're trying to restore ecosystem function, you're not gonna do it unless you choose the right plants. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants, starting with my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It's where my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000 um, to a farm that had been broken up into 10 acre lots. Very old farm, but farmed almost 300 years. The soil was exhausted. Most of the soil was down in a creek over here. Uh, it had been mowed for hay uh, before we, we moved in. And our job, of course, was to restore the ecosystem on, on this piece of property. Uh, well, you do that by putting the caterpillars back. And I tried early on with this species, the Canadian owlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. Uh, and that's what they look like as an adult. But I wanted to see if we could get it to make a living at our property. Well, you're not going to do that unless you have meadow rue. That is the only plant that that, that caterpillar can develop on. And we didn't have any meadow rue. So I got some meadow rue seeds from someplace and planted it. Now, there used to be meadow rue here hundreds of years ago, but um, long gone with all the agriculture. So my meadow root grew very nicely, but this was early on and I actually had very little faith that Canadian alice would, excuse me, I'm getting rid of my lunch. I had very little faith that Canadian alice would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow root. Um, so I didn't even go out and check it for about two months after I, I planted it. Then I was walking by for another reason and I looked over and it was covered with Canadian alice. They had found it right away. It was a huge success. I'm still surprised about that. So now we got a good population of Metaru and Canadian Alice. We've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It is a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. We didn't have any ditch daisy, but I knew where there was some ditch daisy in a power line cut uh, 14 miles away. Um, so I got some seeds, planted them at home. They, they did very nicely. <clears throat> um, so now we have a, a uh, well, it took a, a year for the golden red stowaway to find my Bidens. Finally did. Um, so now we, we have added four species to the property. Same story with the hackberry emperor. Um, I wanted the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be here. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry and celtus, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. Uh, planted several trees. I had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my, my hackberry. They finally did, and now we've got a good population of those. So now we've added six species, and that's how the restoration went. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth, um, plant Virginia creeper, now in the East, a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper, but I don't know why, because uh, it's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover, makes nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. Birds want high fat berries in the fall, and that's what Virginia creeper uh, delivers. It's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. Its flowers are small and inconspicuous. You don't even notice that it's in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees around it. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths. 
that are a primary component of cardinal dye. It's an important bird in our, our ecosystems. Things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I wanted to see if I get the evening primrose moth uh, at our house because it's, it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else, but we didn't have any evening primrose. So I planted it evening uh, Enothera. Uh, the moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. Usually you just see one like this. Uh, you, uh, if you plant Enothera, you can get the Pacific Green Sphinx moth. This is on my bucket list. I'd love to see this beautiful moth. And I planted lots of oaks. Now those are uh, uh, just examples of the plant lineages we put back at our house. I wanna focus on oaks for a while though, because they are such important species. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, it's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing, what it's delivering to your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks, almost all of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to support the moths that create the caterpillars that run the ecosystems that support my, my, my birds and everything else by bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laver and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the, to the oaks right on my property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oaks to start to bring in the wildlife around you to support that food web that runs the ecosystem that supports you. This is what our, our house looks like today. Um, put the plants back. At least a lot of the plants, you know, I'm still adding, adding plants. Uh, but as our, uh, the years went by and our research showed that, that um, the number of moth species in your local food web is a very good index for how, how productive and stable that, that food web is. So five years ago, I uh, took on the challenge of trying to get a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living at our house. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. So we're just talking about moths and I'm up to 1,195 species of moths that now make a living here. Uh, talk about, about uh, restoration success. That's a lot of biodiversity. And we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania's 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we've got 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of those are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says that, that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am, I am certain that we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. Uh, and it didn't take that long, and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. Imagine what would happen if everybody put the plants back. We could, we could turn terrible statistics like this around. So please don't give up. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. A lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties in, for example, suburbia? Well, that is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres. 16, 18 times less land than Cindy, Cindy and I have. Uh, and they live in the middle of a development. Everybody's got the big lawns. When they moved in, their property was choked with Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, another invasive from, from Asia. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of, of native plants, put in a water feature uh, for the birds. And then they sat back and started to count the birds using their yard. And they are up to 149 bird species including 35 warbler species. That is a very good number. Just, just to compare that to what we've seen in our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. 
and this is on 0.6 acres. So does it happen in smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, she's right next to O'Hare Airport. Uh, she has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area at all. So uh, she's a little teeny island. It's a pretty island. Pam is a, a native plant um, landscaper, so she knows how to do it. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature. And then she sat back, as she says, with a glass of wine and started to count the birds using her property. And she's up to 124 species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to do if we're gonna succeed in a big way. We do wanna succeed in a big way. Uh, now this is a national goal. We've got to reduce the amount of area we have in lawn. Uh, and I know this is a, a, a uh, decreasing problem in California because you do not have the water for lawn, but the rest of the country is wasting lots of water on lawn. 40 million acres. That was a 2005 statistic. It's now about 44 million acres. That's an area bigger than New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now, I know we have to do that uh, because it's a status symbol. We gotta advertise our status and we also have to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took the 40 million acres, cut it in half? What if we took areas like this and turned it into this? I got this picture from Dan Getman in Missouri. Never met Dan, but he said, look, I had this big lawn and I'm doing it. I'm putting in a bunch of native plants. Well, that would give us 20 million acres we could put towards conservation right where we live. We could create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park, and it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge plus the Great Smoky Mountains. At up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park would be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put some part of nature at home? We get the opportunity to interact with that part of nature, to, to form a personal relationship with it, which is essential if we're gonna care about nature. And we could do it at our own time, our own pace. All you have to do is go outside or maybe even just look out your window. You can avoid crowds, you know, if you go to a real national park, last year there were 375 million people there with you. So you know what you're going to really see. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential to developing that personal relationship with Mother Nature. And it's particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour to a natural area. Then they walk around for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and become friends with it, get to know it, fall in love with it, alone. No parental supervision. When we hover over our kids as parents, we're sending the message that this is really dangerous. It's not really dangerous. Um, we don't want to, to frighten our kids about nature. Why? Because they're the future stewards of the planet. If they're afraid of it, if they don't know they're the stewards, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't love stewarding, they're going to be terrible stewards. We can't afford any more terrible stewardship. Maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature, a little piece of lawn here with a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of that lizard, you fall in love with that part of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be crawling on the ground for the rest of her life in her best dress catching lizards. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. But I guarantee she's gonna remember these experiences 
uh, when she was catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I guarantee it's going to help her be a good steward of the planet. You want your kids to do more than catch lizards? Get Nancy Strinisti's Nancy Nature Play at home. It's a wonderful book, giving dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, and, and get yourself on the map. What you're going to do, it's free, by the way, is register your property in the peace of your property that you are being a good steward of. If you're if you do have lawn, you're going to reduce it. That's great. That area goes on the map. If you're protecting a, a natural area on your property, that area goes on the map. If you're putting one fall aster in a flower pot for migrating monarchs, that area goes on the map. Uh, and the object is, and then your area of your county lights up. You get to see who else is is uh, participating in good earth stewardship. What we're trying to do. This is our, our attempt at social media to get as many people uh, on the map as pop possible so it all lights up, we can see who's participating. And, and we're trying to get beyond the choir, the people who already know this is important and reach the people who don't have a clue that they are an important part of the future of conservation. In other words, we want this message to go viral. We're trying to change the culture here. We've got 20,000 people on Homegrown National Park. Um, next goal is 20 million people because that's, that's definitely what we need. So please, please uh, get yourself on the map. Um, all right, we're going to reduce the area we have lawn uh, across the country. We're going to, the plants we put back where we had lawn, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. A keystone is a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, I'm calling these native plants keystone plants because uh, they're making most of the food in our food webs. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So if we take them out of the local food web, the food web collapses. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. It's essential, they're the support system. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper and that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. You're not through building your house when you got your keystone plants, but they're an essential component of it. So the question is no longer simply, are native plants uh, better ecologically than non-native plants? On average, they certainly are. But there are a number of natives that don't contribute all that much. So the question really is, do we want to favor those big contributors, the ones that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars, or not? What is supporting the most caterpillars? It's one of our oaks nationwide. Where I live, 557 species of caterpillars are on oaks, over 950 species uh, uh, use oaks nationwide. California has 38 species of oaks. Uh, so you have a tremendous opportunity to support biodiversity by using those oaks. And if you wanna know what all the keystone plants are uh, where you live, uh, it turns out that California has a, a wonderful, um, the California Native Plant Society has a wonderful tool called CalScape, which allows you to track down which native plants belong where you live very specifically. Uh, and tells you how productive they are. I wish every, it's just a wonderful tool, and I wish every, every state had something that powerful. So take advantage of that. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of uh, species to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. Uh, research is showing that, that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines uh, around around the world, but particularly in the temperate zone. These are all the reasons that lights are killing, all the ways that lights are killing insects, particularly the moths that create those caterpillars that we need. But to me, this is, this is good news. We've got to turn around insect declines, not just stop it, but turn it around. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the, on the planet, and they are the little things that run the world. So we gotta turn it around. If we can do that by flicking a switch, uh, we're getting off easy. It's easy to flick switch. There's a lot of switches we got to flick, but but we can do it. But I know what you're going to say. Um, I can't turn the light out over my barn or over my garage or over my, my front porch because the bad man will come. Or I put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED is the best because yellow wavelengths uh, are not very attractive to nocturnal insects. 
if we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would reduce insect mortality by millions. Uh, and if we use LEDs, we would save millions of dollars as well. All right, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows those important caterpillars to complete their development. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The, the caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. But there are exceptions. 94% of the species will complete their, will finish growing as a caterpillar on the tree, but then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the soil and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter uh, under the, the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact our soils so that they're rock hard uh, and, and the caterpillars cannot get underground. So the way we landscape in so many places becomes an ecological trap. The, the moths come in and, and create caterpillars up here and they drop down and they die. I'm convinced that this is another major cause of insect declines across the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. This is what most people do. You've got a tree in a, in a yard and it's usually lawn. And I've got a new grad student this semester that is, is uh, starting to look at how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a layered landscape where you have a tree and then um, maybe well, just a whole bunch of native plants appropriate to your, your biome. Here we've got uh, azalea, ferns, ground cover. This is soft landing. Caterpillars drop down. Uh, they can easily get underground. The ground is not, not compacted with mowing or walking. Plenty of leaf litter to spin their cocoon. Much higher success. Um, this is where you can, you can do uh, you know, spring ephemeral gardening, again, biome appropriate. Uh, you, you, this is how you reduce the lawn. You, you have beds underneath your trees. Living uh, mulch is the best, particularly in, in fire prone areas, uh, but they're all safe sites for those caterpillars. Uh, Yerba Buena is a great ground cover uh, that uh, would be a, a wonderful place for caterpillars to pupate in. I had another grad student, Desiree Narango, who, who uh, did a wonderful job with, with uh, chickadees, wonderful research in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And the results of her study suggest there really is room for compromise in our plant choice. She had one simple question, how well do chickadee populations do in uh, suburban yards that are dominated by native plants versus suburban yards dominated by non-native plants, by introduced ornamentals. And when they're dominated by introduced ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, there was you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. There were nest boxes up in every yard, um, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. And if you put all that information together into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of uh, non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from none to 100%. This is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above the line here, you've got a growing population. And that happens when you have very few non-native plants. But if you have a lot of non-related plants, you dip below that line, and you have an unsustainable population where um, birth rate does not balance out death rate. Now, right here is where those, those um, lines intersect, which suggests, liberally speaking, that you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. And we looked at, we, we stuck to woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage. So this is the area of compromise. Um, now we can't have, we can't tolerate any invasive plants. Invasive plants are, are ecological tumors. They escape and they, they uh, castrate the effectiveness of local ecosystems. But there are a lot of our, our non-natives and a lot of our, yeah, a lot of our non-natives that are not invasive uh, and, and we can compromise with those. Remember Dan Getman? 
Um, that's a ginkgo. That's from, from Asia. Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native plant landscape? He's got a ginkgo because his wife likes ginkgos and asked him to put one in. So he did. Uh, is it destroying the functionality of this landscape? No. Is it invasive? Is it going to spread throughout the ecosystem? No. It's just there. So I tend to think of plants like this as if they are statues. There you go. There's Dan's statue. So the question is how many, you know, if your entire landscape is a statue, it's not going to be very productive. It is not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those, those uh, contributing native plants. If we have more of these, we can tolerate more of these. Can we use uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lino Shaughnessy design taken by a drone for, uh, 400 feet up, I think, yeah. Um, that is, you don't get more formal than that. And every plant in that landscape is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're, they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it, formalize it. It convinces your neighbor that this is not a mistake. This is not a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It meets the needs of several species of bees. Now it's not very big, it could be bigger, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. And remember why we need pollinators? I don't like the, the reason you hear all the time and that is because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually about a 12th of our crops. But then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. You need pollinators and you need them everywhere because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that is not an option. How about California lilac? Wonderful pollinator plant, beautiful. Uh, we can certainly get a lot more of these into our landscapes. Or native asters. There's lots of, of possibilities that would really help our pollinators, regardless of whether you are near a, a farm or not. This is a Drew Latham design, much bigger than that first one we saw. Measure the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer to me. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can. More and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program that encourages homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's very popular. There's an island off Florida that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the, in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species in your yard, we're going to pay you to be a good steward of it rather than fine you if you, if you do something on your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on these invasive ornamentals. Like, like calorie pear or burning bush or, or barberry or all the things that, that have escaped our, our gardens. 85% of our woody invasive plants in this country are escapees from our gardens. So in, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, North Carolina, uh, you take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. South Carolina has banned them all together. Starting to make real progress here. A uh, number of municipalities are giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient native species instead of the thirsty non natives. And of course, the big uh, lawn reduction programs in California. This going up now, it's $3 per, per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you remove and replace with azeric planting. You know that you do not have one drop of, of water available to waste on cool season European grasses. And if you want more information on these, these different um, opportunities, memorize this. Okay, we have made, in my opinion, three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's important. Um, we've, we've come to think of nature as if it's optional, not essential. We like nature, we like to visit it, we like to walk through it, uh, but it, we see it more as entertainment. And of course, if it's, if it's not, essential when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature will take a back seat. We're going to fund the things that are essential. I went to the uh, Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our, our society's uh, 
view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so the future generations can enjoy it. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for the national park system. They're beautiful places. We want to save them so the future generations can enjoy them. But to me, that just reinforces the notion that nature's there for, for entertainment. It is enormously entertaining, but it's much more important than that. We need nature so that we have future generations, a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we, if we restrict conservation just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail. Uh, and we can't afford to fail. We're gonna fail because those areas are too small and too isolated. David Quammen has a, a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back not just to create biological carters that connect viable habitat, but to recreate viable habitat where we've destroyed it. This is starting to happen now. And when, when we finish putting those plants back, it'll be the first time in modern history where we humans are coexisting with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Reshworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean that, that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. So many of our, our, our uh, well, so many people recognize the earth has serious problems now and they get depressed over that. What can one person do? They feel powerless. Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can put in keystone plants, one person can plant a pollinator garden, one person can, can fix the light system on their property, one person can, can use, did I say use keystone plants, can get rid of the invasive plants that are already on their property. One person can totally revitalize the ecosystem uh, on their, their piece of land and then enhance their greater local ecosystem rather than detract from it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire Earth's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the Earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now, I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Hi. Wow. That was amazing. Our are we all digesting all of that information right now? Um, I, I need to go get new light bulbs and like all the plants need to be caterpillar plants in my garden. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. I'm, I, I, I think I'm still digesting that information, but what I really like about it, um, well, I like what you said about, you know, you don't have to, I think there's an intimidation for a lot of people that it's kind of like all or nothing mm -hmm. um, if you want to do this. And I think just the fact that you showed that you can just do a little small patch or a pot or something like that, that's going to invite uh, native pollinators and uh, support the ecology some and, and all of that sort of chips away and helps the larger problem. 
something that I didn't say is you don't have to do it all at once either. You can have ultimate goals and pick at it over the next 20 years. It's just everything you do contributes. So yeah, don't be intimidated. Um, I'm sure Dan has a lot to say, but I did want to bring up one of the questions that, that came up uh, right away. And it's, and it's uh, come about fairly recently in California is native milkweed versus non-native milkweed. Um, they've actually banned Am, am I right, Dan? Non-native milkweed in Marin um, and San Francisco, and probably uh, East Bay soon. And um, just simply because it disrupts the migration pattern of the monarch butterfly. So we did want to just speak to that for a second. Okay, let me let me add. I don't know about California, but in the rest of the country. Uh, there's a serious monarch disease. It's a protozoan. You just call it OE. Uh, and milkweeds that that don't die back each year, which is that you know Asclepias curassavica, the non-native, they harbor the the spores of of that uh, OE. And as you move further south, the spore populations accumulate on those non-native milkweeds. And when monarchs visit it, up to 90% of them get infected. So that's an even better reason to not use the non-natives than, than the migration thing. Mm, great. Right, here, I, I think other counties around the area will follow what Marin did, but uh, the Asclepias curassavica is now uh, outlawed and we can't sell it, which is a good thing. Uh, the two native species that are most uh, commonly available are showy milkweed, Asclepias speciosa, and narrow leaf milkweed, uh, Asclepias fascicularis. Those were both native around here before the uh, cattle industry eradicated them pretty much, mm -hmm. uh, feeling that they were poisonous to the cattle. Uh, uh, Doug, the, uh, can you remind us the Pacific Sphinx moth? What does it live on? Evening primrose, Enothera. Evening oh, primrose. Uh -huh. or, or any of its close relatives. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, do, do you have a list of uh, favorite um, flowers for the monarchs to feed uh, the, the adults to feed on as opposed to the caterpillars? We know the caterpillars have to be on milkweed. But right. the adults uh, just need nectar, right? Right. That's what fuels the migration. So anything that is blooming in the fall during the migration, that's what they're going to use. In the east here, uh, goldenrod is very important in the fall blooming asters. So I'm not sure what's, what's in bloom uh, where you are right now, but right now is when they need it. Or maybe, you know, I'd say starting early September right through. Um, now, your monarchs don't have to go that far. Uh, our monarchs have to go from Canada all the way to, to Mexico, mm -hmm. and they need forage all the way down. But um, yeah, a lot of people get, get uh, their mistake, and they think the only thing a monarch needs is milkweed. Well, it's the only thing they need to reproduce, but they need, they need that nectar. Uh, and you know, that's not the only migrating butterfly you've got. You've got uh, several species that go up and down the coast. So those nectar-producing plants are very important. Right. Doug I think oh, one of the things that, that uh, this talk points out to me is we have charismatic uh, uh, animals like monarchs that we're all aware of, but there are so many critical and maybe one might even say more critical uh, types of moths, butterflies that make caterpillars that the birds eat. Um, the monarchs specialize on a plant, plant that's poisonous in order that the caterpillars don't get eaten by the birds. Uh, and uh, so it's all these sacrificial lambs out there that are keeping all the birds going by eating benign things like our oak trees. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's ironic. I mean, the reason we want to save the monarch is because it's a beautiful butterfly. It's really not a pollinator. Most butterflies are terrible at pollination. It's the bees that are moving the pollen to the female parts of the flowers. The butterflies are, are uh, depending on the nectar. Uh, and we do want to save them, but uh, in, in terms of ecological functionality, it's the moths and the bees that are doing the bulk of the work. Uh, I was thinking when you were talking about caterpillars, um, just 
because we are retail based and we do have people come in, caterpillar damage is not super sightly for a lot of plants. And I'm wondering if, if you're wanting to convert into this whole uh, system, mm -hmm. what would you say is, I mean, is it like a year, a year after you stop spraying for caterpillars that you start seeing the birds eating it and more of a natural thing? Like, is there a lag time basically? And we have to put up with some damage for a little, if that makes sense. Before you get things in balance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people do say, oh, you get all those caterpillars, you're going to have defoliation. No, remember the birds are eating hundreds a day. So typically the, the people say, I can't find any caterpillars. Mm. Um, so um, how long does that take? It depends on which plants you, you put in. And, you know, when you hang a bird feeder up, they find it within, usually within days. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks. They know where the food is. They find it. They will find those caterpillars too. It's if you if you put food in your yard in the terms of, of of plants that make the caterpillars, the birds will learn that in short order. So no, it's not a year. It's much much faster than that. Great. We have a a, a question here. Uh, the California resource that you shared, which was calscape.org. Um, the question is, can you share some native plants that are least water dependent here? We, we don't want you to have to become a West Coast expert. Um, Calscape will be extremely helpful with that and your local nursery, whether that's a Sloat or any other nursery, uh, will be very helpful in finding you drought resistant plants or drought tolerant plants for your ecosystem. And remember in the Bay Area here, we've got hundreds of microclimates and we have wet areas and dry areas, even in a drought. Uh, so go to your local garden center and talk to a knowledgeable person and, and they will help you with that. Uh, yeah, and do, oh, <laughs> go ahead. I mentioned California lilac. That's one species of ceanothus. You've got a number of species of ceanothus. It's a great caterpillar plant as well as pollinator uh, that are adapted to different parts of your, your eco region. So that would be one genus to focus on. You've got something called mountain mahogany. It's another really good uh, caterpillar plant, so. Right, uh, how's the Arctostaphylus for caterpillars, the manzanitas? Manzanita. <laughs> um, some specialists, I don't think it's all that high, but this is, this is exactly the benefit of Calscape. Look it up, it'll tell you exactly where you, for, for your specific region. The reason Calscape's better than, than uh, Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website is that that is based on county. Well, your most of your California counties are huge, and you've got a number of biomes within it. And Calscape is has geo referenced every single plant species in the state, so you can see exactly where it occurs and say, "I live here. This is what's going to support it here." It's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Uh, one person's worried that they they've planted a bunch of native milkweeds and they all get eaten up entirely by the caterpillars. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> No, but plant more. <laughs> yeah, you don't have enough. You don't. Yeah. Have enough. <laughs> um, you you don't want to get a, a monarch caterpillar to its fourth instar and then have it run out of food because then it dies. You haven't killed the milkweed because it'll come up from the roots. But think of milkweeds in terms of milkweed patches, not milkweed single ramets. You want a patch big enough that it can it can support. Um, at least the offspring from a single female that flies by right through to the point where they form their, their chrysalis. Uh, so yeah, plant more milkweed. It just shows how desperately your monarchs need them. You've lost 99 point something percent of your monarchs. You, this is the last chance you guys get to, to bring them back. Yeah, I, I I've, did. Had, oh. I've had that happen where the monarchs eat every single leaf on the plants yeah. that I have. And then one is scurrying around trying to find more. And uh, I, I wish they could assess better how much food was available for their offspring, but uh, I guess they can't quite do that. Well, you know what happens? A female flies by looking for milkweed. She's got to lay her egg. She sees one, she lays her egg. Then she flies around, no more milkweed. So she sees one, it's the same one. So she lays <laughs> another egg and all of a sudden she's, she's laid on more than they can handle. And that's what happens. 
I did really want to speak quickly to the Calscape. So another feature on Calscape, and I use it all the time, is the advanced search. So everybody just like dive into that website, but in the advanced search, you can put stuff like low water, mm. uh, bee friendly, butterfly friendly. You, you can click a bunch of boxes and it'll generate a list based on whatever boxes that you check, even flower color, how tall it gets. I mean, it's an incredible resource. So yeah. definitely check that out. Yeah, every every plant in it is tagged with all these different items so that it, you can pull up a plant and see at a glance, is it deer resistant? Does it right. support bees? Does it support uh, caterpillars? Uh, it's a wonderful resource. Um, what, there's a question about leaf blowers and, you know, maintenance to gardens and and whatnot and you know we we like to keep them tidy but it would would you say there's a balance between sort of keeping some on the ground and or what how would you address that yeah uh well yes we do like neatness it's just kind of a human trait uh, and this is this is where grass actually becomes appropriate it's a cue for care so if you have a strip of lawn um, outlining a, a, uh, a bed, of course the leaves go in the bed, but not on, not on the grass. And it, it's, you know, it, it formalizes it. People love that. It shows that you are involved with your landscape, that you haven't moved out. Um, so there are places where it's inappropriate to keep leaves for sure. Um, I keep, I keep saying, get them into the, into the beds. And yes, I know about the fire danger and you don't want them next to your house. Uh, we, we understand all that. Um, so it's, it's a compromise. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't own your own property, I mean, would you just say you can do small gardens, you know, in containers or, I mean, that's basically what you're saying, just anything, even if it's one plant, right? Yeah, you know, if you're in an apartment, you've got a balcony. Um, that's one thing about about bees; they're really mobile. They will find flowering plants wherever you put it, rooftop, wherever you put it. Another thing I've been thinking about is with with apartment dwellers, um, if there is any landscape at all around the apartment. Now you don't own it and you can't control it, but go to the superintendent and say, "Can I take care of this particular tree? Can I put a bed around it? Can I, it's, you know, do the stuff that that the landowner is not going to." want to do because he just doesn't have the time or the resources. In other words, you're going to adopt a piece of that landscape. Um, I have found more often than not, they're happy to turn that over to you. You're doing it for free, but you get to contribute to that landscape, even though you don't own it. Well, I, Dan, do you have anything else to say? Well, I just see a couple of questions here yeah. about, uh, one of them is an interesting question, pine needles. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Do conifers support the kind of life that we're talking about? Yeah, native native conifers certainly do. Uh, pines are in the top top ten uh, nationwide. Um, so absolutely. Now mm -hmm. you know I'm not talking about all the exotic conifers from Japan, but um, number of things and and depends on which ecosystems you're you're in. There are there are substantial parts of the West, where there are few to no oaks that occur naturally, it's replaced by conifers. And they and the cottonwoods along streams take over the keystone roles. So yes, absolutely, conifers are very important. And again, native native conifers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, a Japanese maple, uh, that's about as exotic as you can get in a sense. It comes from far away. It comes from, from the West here. It's not a dry summer climate kind of tree. Uh, would you leave the leaf litter on the ground? Would that be helpful to any of the insects we're talking about? Well, the, the role of leaf litter is to protect the soil moisture that's in the ground, which supports the ground community. There are more species that live underground than above the ground. Uh, and um, they don't really care what, what type of leaf litter is doing that. 
so yes, if I had one, I would leave the, the leaf litter if I could. Um, you know, the, the, the contribution that your Japanese maple is making will depend on whether there's any native maples in your immediate uh, ecosystem. If there are none, it'll probably make zero contribution at all. If you have native maples, there could be some crossover between natives, between the insects that use your native maples and, and um, Japanese maple. I've seen that a few, a few times. It's not going to support as much as the native maples, but it might, it might support something. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll throw that as a compromise. It could be an excellent example of that 30% compromise that I talked about, though. Right. There are native maple here is the big leaf maple grows mainly along stream beds uh, and isn't used very much as an introduced um, landscape uh, plant. But if right. you live along a stream bed, you might very well have some. 